So that said, we're excited to go Wednesday. We're, we're ready. And following our successful launch, we, we've got about a 10-day transfer orbit until we get to geosynchronous altitude. During that time, we're controlled out of the Boeing Mission Control Center in El Segundo. Following deployments, we hand over to the Teachers Ground Station in White Sands, New Mexico, and from there we do about three months of on-orbit test and calibration. Uh, following on-orbit test and calibration, we'll, there will be an on-orbit acceptance review, and then uh, the spacecraft will be drifted to its uh, on operational location. Uh, but it doesn't end here. What's coming up next for our, our project and, and our Boeing teammates are we're, we're finishing up the Tedris L spacecraft. It'll go into storage within the next two months and we'll be back here hopefully about a year from now launching a, on another Atlas V mission to, to launch Tedris L. And we continue to work towards uh, Tedris M and we're ready to go with Tedris M in December of 2015. So thank you. Thank you, George. Thank you, Jeff. And a look now at Wednesday's weather. Launch Weather Officer Joel Chambiolo from the 45th Weather Squadron. Joel. Thank you, George, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. This time of year, as far as weather systems affecting Florida, the main things that we track are cold fronts that typically, on average, move through the state, oh, roughly every four or five days. And when we're approaching a launch campaign, obviously the timing of these uh, cold fronts moving through the state uh, directly impacts what kind of weather we can uh, anticipate. This uh, mission is no different. Uh, we will be tracking a cold front. Uh, right now, uh, if you can see the satellite picture, uh, basically that the system well up to the north uh, west of that picture is really the, the entire weather system that will basically be organizing and, and pushing a cold front through us and right now the timing of that cold front again timing is critical when we are uh, comparing it or approaching a launch uh, right now the timing of this front has it moving through the uh, area on a very early morning hours on Thursday after the launch window now uh, during uh, kind of starting on Tuesday as far as the uh, rollout to the pad. What we can expect in terms of our local weather conditions will be very similar to what we're seeing today. Uh, we're going to see breezy southeasterly winds. Could be an isolated shower or two in the area tomorrow, but we're not really anticipating any weather, significant weather impacts uh, as far as rolling out to the pad. Moving on uh, to uh, Wednesday during the day, again that cold front that I mentioned will be approaching the northwestern portions of the state and will be over north central Florida during the afternoon and evening hours. Uh, with that, our local weather conditions uh, will continue to be breezy. The winds will be shifting on a kind of a Compared to what they are now, they'll be uh, shifting in a clockwise fashion to more of a south and southwesterly direction on uh, Wednesday afternoon. Again, we could have a few showers pop up ahead of the main frontal band during the afternoon hours on uh, Friday or on Wednesday and Wednesday evening. Uh, but right now, we're, we're looking at a 40% chance of having uh, one of our weather rules being violated during uh, the launch window. Again, we're not anticipating the frontal passage until after the launch window, until after midnight, early morning hours on Thursday. And again, uh, we'll be uh, tracking all the weather out ahead of that front. So to be a little bit more specific in terms of weather conditions uh, during the launch window, again, we're going to have a couple scattered or a couple cloud decks, a, sc a low scattered deck at around 3,000 feet and a more broken overcast type deck at around 26,000 feet. Uh, the visibility should be good. The winds will be breezy. In fact, it will be windy on Wednesday. The wind direction will be 190 degrees, which is just slightly southwest of due south, or slightly west of due south. And right now the forecast is for 24 knots uh, with gusts up to 28 knots during the uh, launch window. Uh, for your information, the launch wind constraint uh, based on that wind direction is 33 knots. Uh, there will be some isolated showers in the area. Again, we could have some showers pop up ahead of the main frontal boundary, which again is not expected until after the launch window. The temperature at, uh, during the window will be around 70 degrees. And again, as I mentioned, we're looking at a 40% chance of having one of our weather rules being violated. The two main, issues, the two main rules we'll be going to watch in is the cumulus cloud rule and the uh, disturbed weather rule. Those are the two uh, 
natural and trigger lightning constraints that we'll be watching. And, and also in terms of ground winds. Again, it will be windy that day, but based on the direction, we're not anticipating a ground wind violation. Again, the front moves through after the launch window, and if we do need to go into a 24-hour uh, slip into Thursday evening, the front, again, will be well to our south. The main issue on the next day will be the winds. Uh, it'll still be windy, but the key there is that the wind direction will be uh, more out of the north and northwest. Now, from that direction, the wind constraint is only 25 knots, and because of that, and we could have some lingering post-frontal thick clouds in the area, but the main issue for the next day, if that were to be needed, uh, would be the ground winds. There's a 60% chance that we would have a ground wind violation uh, for the 24-hour slip. As our forecast uh, for the uh, winds that day will be 20, gusting up to 25 knots with a wind direction of 350 degrees. And again, the wind constraint for that day is 25 knots, so there is that going to be that threat. And it will be cooler the next day, hence the cold front move through. It'll be in the uh, low to mid-60s. <laughs> so with that, and again, in summary, we're going to be tracking a cold front. Um, hopefully things will go as scheduled and we'll be able to beat the front through. Uh, but again, that's well, the thing that we're going to be tracking throughout the day on Wednesday into uh, Wednesday night. Thank you. George. Thanks, Joel. And we're ready now to take questions. Please give your name and affiliation when the microphone gets to you. And we'll start here in the front with Marsha. Marcia Dunn, Associated Press. A couple of questions for Mr. Gramling. Um, are you going to be putting this newest TDRS into service? Will it be a spare? What are, what are your near-term plans for it once it's in its proper orbit and checked out? I, I believe the near-term plan is to drift it to 171 West, where it will be put into service for some period of time um, and tested with, with users for a little while longer. And after that, I think will be reevaluated at some point, and, it, it, and whether it stays in service or it goes into storage as a backup. When will that be? Um, when will it be going into service? Do you, how many months after launch? Or we we complete complete our on-orbit test program about three months after launch, and then we would begin operations to drift it to, like I said, 171 West, where we would put it into service for some period of time to test with users. I imagine within you know two or three months after that, a decision would be made about whether it stays in service or it goes into into storage. All right, and I saw in the press kit that the um, Tedris K and L plus the White Sands modifications cost about 715 million. Could you sort of break that down to the specific satellite if possible? So for, for TDRS-K, the, the portion of that uh, is about 350 to 400 million. Of That doesn't include launch vehicles, but uh, it, it depends on how we break out the non-recurring cost and spread it between TDRS-K and L and how we account for project office costs, but it would be somewhere in the 350 to 400 million range. Rocket, or it does. I'm sorry. Rocket costs. I'm no, sorry. Doesn't does not. All right. Thank cost. you. Thanks. Additional questions. You over here, Bill. I know this is uh, Bill Harwood, CBS News. I know this is probably spelled out in the press kit, obviously, but uh, again, a teacher's question. I, I remember when the first one went up way back when aboard Challenger, I guess, and then you've had this series since then. Is there a way to? in lay terms to talk about the capability of this vehicle versus the originals or are they pretty much roughly the same now compared to then? Sure, so you're right, the, we launched the first Tedris back in 1983 and the first seven were launched on, on the space shuttle. The last space shuttle launch was 1995, that was F-7. Uh, so that, that version of the Tedris, if you will, was was fairly similar to what we're flying today. We had the single access, the two single access antennas that had S-band and KU band, and then we had the S-band multiple access phased array. When we got to the HIJ series in 1995 was when we awarded the contract. The the only change we, we made was we added uh, KA band services to the single access reflectors. That's a higher bandwidth service, and we continue to fly those uh, that service on the K spacecraft that we'll be flying this week. The other change that we made from from the HIJ series, or the, the change we made from the HIJ series was on the 1 through 7 spacecraft, we did the beam forming for the return S-band uh, uh, phased array antenna on the ground. 
on HIJ, we departed from that architecture and we did the beam forming on the spacecraft. Well, uh, there, the uses, there have been novel uses of the system that have evolved over time, and one of those novel services was, was a demand access service. And it turns out to do the demand access service, we need to form the beam on the ground. So for the KLM series, we've reverted back to you know, ground-based beam forming for the S-band multiple access return system. You're welcome. Any other questions here? I think we have one on the line from Marion Kramer from Space News. Go ahead. Hi. Uh, yeah, this is Marion Kramer of Space.com. Um, I am mostly here. So how many uh, Teardris satellites have been in orbit? How many are still in orbit? And um, what is the life expectancy on the oldest one at the moment? So this is Jeff Cranling again. We, like I said, we launched the first one in 1983. The, the life, design life of the first Tedris spacecraft, and those were uh, TRW spacecraft, now Northrop Grumman. Um, Ten-year design life, beginning in HIJ, the, it's been a 15-year design life. Tedris F1 actually lasted 27 years on orbit, so that that has been retired for a few years now, and we've since retired one other Tedris spacecraft, F4. So, of the 10 we've launched, um, we've retired two. And all of the F-1 through 7 spacecraft have, have lasted well beyond design life. F-3, I'm not sure I remember right off the top of my head what its predicted end of service date is. But like I said, we're, we're well beyond design life. And, and that's been good for us. I'm not sure if I answered your question completely. No, you did. That was great. Thanks a lot. Any other questions uh, here in the uh, newsroom? Marsha. Oh, yes. I'm wondering when will it be renamed to Tedris 11? What, at what point will that be? I believe the convention is, and I'll have to check on this, is once we accept it on orbit and put it into service, we would start calling it F11. Any additional questions? All right, in that event, a couple of programming notes. You can follow the uh, launch as we go along on Twitter, on um, hashtag Tigris, and on the web at nasa.gov uh, uh, slash Tigris. And um, our launch coverage on NASA TV on uh, Wednesday will begin at 6.15 p.m. Eastern Time. And uh, we'll conclude uh, now. We'll wrap up the briefing and go to... Uh, a, uh, uh, a programming uh, feature on space tracking. And thank you very much. Thirty years ago, NASA launched into a new era of high bandwidth continuous space communication with the tracking and data relay satellite, TDRIS. Today, NASA is continuing this legacy by launching the first of the next generation of satellites, Tedris K. Nine, At Cape Canaveral, eight, the Tedris K spacecraft six, sits atop an Atlas V rocket four, ready for launch. Three, two, one, and lift off the Atlas V rocket carrying the next generation and tracking and data relay satellites, Tedris K. After a four minute burn, the Atlas V main engine separates from the Centaur engine and drops back to Earth. Shortly after separation of the main engine, the protective shield that covers the payload, called the ferry, separates to reveal the Tejas K spacecraft. After boosting the spacecraft to geosynchronous transfer orbit, the Tejas spacecraft separates from the Centaur engine. Shortly after this separation, the two folded single access antenna reflectors are released to take their natural parabolic shape. Once arriving in geosynchronous orbit, the spacecraft starts its deployment sequence by unfolding the first solar array. Next, the two single access antennas are deployed and locked into position. These antennas are designed to track and communicate with low Earth orbit satellites. After the single access antennas are secured into place, 
the second solar array starts to unfold and the SGL and Omni antennas are deployed. Once Tedris K completes this deployment sequence, it's now ready for a three month period of testing and calibration before being placed into service. With this edition of Tedris K and the upcoming launches of Tedris L,